first of all, thanks again for making the time to uh, have this interview, and congratulations on, on your award, on Thank the Turing you. Award. Thank you. Um, so you won it with two other people, and I'm wondering, first of all, about that collaboration. How did that happen? So Jeff Hinton and Jan Lucarn, they have been both mentors for me when I was a younger researcher and younger faculty. And the work of Jeff Hinton has been extremely influential when I was doing my own grad studies. Um, he was my, my role model. And then as I became a faculty, I got a chance to interact with him more. He was in Toronto, I was in Montreal, and it was a natural uh, alignment of our research interests. And then um, with um, Jan, basically I did a postdoc in his group uh, even before joining University of Montreal. And we worked a lot together over uh, decades. So they, they have really um, brought a lot to my um, own intuitions and understanding. And we share a very strong vision of where AI um, uh, is going and at the time where we thought it should go, uh, where other people didn't necessarily share those views. We united our forces to convince the rest of our community of, of these ideas and it worked. So you mentioned that you've gone back quite a long time and AI has changed a tremendous amount since, since the 80s and 90s. Uh, let's start with the work for which you got recognition uh, from uh, the Turing Award and then maybe go backwards and say sort of how you got there. So what the Turing Award recognizes is the influence of the work that the three of us have done on neural networks and more uh, maybe uh, striking is the advances that have been brought with deep learning in this century. So it's a different way of thinking about AI where instead of focusing on symbols and logic, we focus on learning and what we call distributed representations, which just means that concepts are represented by patterns of activations in your brain, but also in these computer programs that, ha inf that, that are influenced by, inspired by what we know about the brain, but of course are not necessarily trying to copy neuroscience because we don't know how the brain works but uh, potentially one day actually are giving back to neuroscience ideas about uh, theories about how brains might learn complex things. Because this is what we have achieved in the last few years, is that our neural net models are now really, really good at a number of tasks, um, especially perception. Now you say uh, neural nets are, get, are good at a number of tasks, and one of the questions that comes up in AI a lot is about general AI versus specific AI. Um, does you, how does your work address that, or, or is that an issue that you're, you're focusing on? So, absolutely. What got me into the field of neural networks in the mid-80s is this really amazing hypothesis that there might be a few simple general principles that could explain our intelligence. And of course, if we understood those principles, we could build intelligent machines. Now, that being said, I don't think that human intelligence is totally general. In fact, we are very good at some things, and we know we're really bad at other things where, say, current computers are much better than us. So um, talking about general intelligence maybe is a... Uh, more wishful thinking and uh, direction of research, uh, whereas I prefer to use the term human-level AI, and if we can build machines that have our abilities uh, covering a broad range of potential cognitive tasks, but still not every possible task, that would already be amazing and would be uh, completely disruptive and transformative for society. And where do you think we are on the path? So we are at an interesting place where we've made amazing progress. We can see so many tasks where now computers are able to, say, understand to some extent images, sounds, translate from one language to another way better than they were able to 5, 10, 20 years ago. At the same time, when we look at the mistakes that those systems are making, and we compare them to uh, human performance. 
um, we realize that we are very far from human-level AI. So it's sort of far both ways. And uh, it's good for people like me because um, I'm, I'm looking for um, progress. I'm looking for uh, failures of our current system so that we can move forward and, and, and discover new things that are exciting. So I'd like to turn the attention a little bit to uh, the HLF and sort of what it's about and the idea of mentorship and uh, what happens when you're in your late 20s, let's say, and developing. Now, when, when you were in your late 20s, that was the AI winter kind of, wasn't it? Right. Yeah, I, I really owe a lot to all those people who have given me attention and have um, provided inspiration for me. Um, I mentioned Jeff Hinton and Jan Lucan, but actually uh, many others. And places like uh, this meeting at HLF really are so important for the young generation. And we need them because the problems we're going to need to solve in the future are probably different from the ones we have solved in the past. And we need these young minds to explore in many directions. Uh, maybe break some of the barriers we have, uh, blindfolds that we have because of uh, our own experience. So uh, one of the reasons why I decided to stay in academia in spite of the uh, call from industry is precisely because I enjoy so much that interaction with uh, uh, younger minds, with students and collaborating with them. Um, and in the academic setting, of course, you get that. Uh, I have a large group of students and postdocs working with me. And I believe also it's a duty to help train the next generation, both in our usual university setting, but today also thinking about the larger picture of the democratization of AI around the planet. Uh, I'd like to see developing countries build up their own AI talent so that they can take advantage of those tools for themselves. Besides things like the HLF, do you have any ideas for how that might happen? Yes. Um, one of the things we're doing at Mila is we're trying to get um, students, interns from developing countries to spend time, like three months or six months, sometimes more, in, 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 our, in our institute. And um, I think more research organizations should be doing that. They go back to their country, they bring a network of connections, they bring a better understanding of how research is done. They uh, can help teach their peers back home. So I think that's one of the things we can do. But, but in general, we can also participate in the development of an open science where the code we produce uh, can be easily reused uh, and, and made, of course, open source and available, where we not only write papers, but um, uh, go to forums where we, we make our work easy to understand, for example, in, in summer schools and things like this. So there are many ways in which we can participate in this uh, diffusion of, of knowledge. Now, you mentioned Mila, and I think that takes some explanation of what it is and how it got started and its right. goals. So Mila started as just my lab, and then it grew to a larger group with uh, two, three, four, five faculties in, 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 in my university doing machine learning and deep learning in particular. And then it grew even more as uh, we merged the um, machine learning researchers it, at UDM in my, University of Montreal and McGill University across the mountain in Montreal. Um, and then it grew even more as we attracted uh, funding from governments and companies which are starting to build an ecosystem of AI researchers, entrepreneurs, startups uh, in the same neighborhood in Montreal. So now there's uh, 300 something researchers at Mila focusing on deep learning and reinforcement learning. So it's one of the, if not the greatest concentration of deep learning researchers in academia in the world. 300 at one time? Yes. Wow. And how long has it been going? Well, it's been growing steadily in the last few years, exponentially. And uh, now I think we have to, <laughs> to slow down uh, to be able to manage this. Um, we just moved into a new building in January this year, but really it's been, you know, I, I created the, my group in 1993 and then it's been a slow ramp up, but it's in the last three, four years that really it grew very fast and universities 
started recruiting machine learning um, uh, faculty to, uh, to, to, to grow that group. So you're seeing a lot of students of around the same age, students and researchers of around the same age as are at the HLF. Exactly. And what's also really nice about Mila is that the student population is a reflection of the diversity around the world. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's very selective. Getting there uh, is, is a huge competition, but we have some of the best students from all, all around the planet and it creates a spirit which is um, uh, very different from if you had everybody from the same background and thinking in the same way. Um, there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of synergy between different groups from different professors, um, collaborations also with startups, uh, lots of students creating their own companies and things like this. So because you're, you're in touch with this age group so much and people at the same stage as the folks at HLF, uh, do you notice a difference in either the challenges that they face or the attitudes or uh, anything else sort of in the academic environment from when you were around that age? Yeah, so um, on the positive side, there's a lot of excitement around AI these days. So a lot of students are jumping into the field and on the negative side, maybe related to this, there is a lot of competition. Um, when there were a handful of labs working on this stuff, uh, you could play it with an idea for years and not worry too much about whether someone else would publish the same thing. But now if you have a good idea, you better uh, race to post it on archive in order to make sure you're the first one to, to publish. So there's a lot of anxiety in the students to publish, 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 which I think is not good for long-term research, for, for deeper research. And I'm not sure how to fix this, but uh, it, it also has to do with our publication model based on conferences, which is a typical uh, situation in computer science these days, uh, which provides a sort of incentive for incremental research and, you know, there's conference deadline one after the other, and you're chasing the next deadline. So I'm just going to take a quick look at my notes here uh, to make sure that I, I catch everything. So if you'll excuse me for just a second. Mm -hmm. um, going back to, uh, and ex I, I'm sort of harping on this because it seems like such a big thing in the field of artificial intelligence, the whole AI winter time. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned the possibility of, of being pulled away into industry. Yes. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that, a little bit more about uh, what were the opportunities and how did you balance it out? You mentioned the love that you have for the academic setting. Well, yeah, I've always felt good in the academic setting and uh, it's the students, as I mentioned, and the interaction and the, the leverage, um, the joy of working with them. Um, but it's also the feeling that we're doing things for the greater good that are going to belong to everyone and not just to uh, one particular company. Um, it's also the freedom that one has. Um, I can talk about my ideas even before they are published. I do it all the time. Um, I don't have to think about patents. I don't have to think about um, you know, secrecy. Uh, so there, there is a lot of um, positive factors for me uh, staying in academia, and another reason why I decided to stay where I am now is because I wanted to build something around the university labs around Mila, uh, which would be more than than a research institute, um, but would also be a whole ecosystem that could give back to the community and and build. Uh, an alternative to the concentration that we're seeing now in, in, in Silicon Valley, for example, and potentially in China. For people who are facing the kind of discouragement that, uh, well, it would probably be different because it's not, you were in this unusual situation of the topic becoming less popular and then more popular again. But of course, every, every field has its disappointments. What advice would you give to young researchers when they're facing that sort of, I don't know whether I should continue in this field? These are difficult questions. And well, intuition 
becomes really important. And so it's not like I can give a recipe for success. There is no such thing. But one reason why the three of us succeeded is simply because we were persistent. In a way, we were stubborn and didn't go with the flow and the trends, but followed what we thought was uh, an important direction that needed to be studied. Now, you have to be careful when you do this, of course. You have to also remain in contact with reality. So if you believe in something intuitively, you also need to check yourself through evidence, through experiments, uh, theory. And uh, we had the, not only the feeling that we were doing the right thing, but also our own work, our own experimental work um, was consistent with that. So, of course, you don't want to delude yourself by just following your intuition, which couldn't be wrong. Uh, so there's a fine line to walk here. You mentioned in your talk this morning um, about the ethical issues of AI, uh, which I suppose are becoming more important now. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about, about that and where you think the inflection points are going to be? Yeah, so essentially we are building powerful tools with AI. I mean, humans have been building tools forever. This is a characteristic of, of humanity. But we're now building tools that could be dangerous because they are becoming so powerful. And so it becomes really important to think of how at the level of society we make sure that those tools are used for good, uh, for the greater good of the whole planet, of, of humanity, and not abused, not um, um, misused for the benefit of a few, uh, our greed, or to dominate um, people. For example, the ability to recognize faces can be used in uh, surveillance uh, by authoritarian governments. It could also be used in the military to build uh, killer drones that can identify their target and kill without having a human in the loop, which is not only immoral, but dangerous from the point of view of um, the military stability that we have right now around the planet. And there are other things that are scary, for example, how AI machine learning could be used to influence people's minds through advertising, social networks, and we know how that can distort politics and can be a danger for democracy. So these are examples that are really serious. Uh, at the same time, AI can be incredibly useful, and so we need to make sure we set the right social norms, the right rules of the game um, to avoid this, uh, these uh, bad uses and promote the good uses. Um, and then um, that's something that's not just in the hands of scientists. It's, it's the whole society, it's uh, scholars from uh, social sciences and humanities, it's governments, it's the media, it's uh, civil society need to be involved in those discussions. Uh, so what would you say are good uses of AI? Well, there are many good uses of AI. For several years now, we've been working on medical applications and uh, the low hanging fruit here for which there's already commercialization is the analysis of medical images. For example, we've been working on detection of cancer cells, uh, which can really help doctors maybe uh, avoid uh, little details that they had missed. Another area that we're starting to look at, and we just put out a very long review paper on, is how machine learning can be used to help fight climate change, whether it's in uh, more efficient use of our uh, energy resources, or designing new materials, um, or uh, having better climate models, or, or many other uses. There's a lot of potential here, it's only starting. We can also use machine learning to help education, so there are, um, researchers and even companies building systems to help do some kind of uh, personalized education, right? So based on your particular profile, what, what is the material I need to present to you so that you can learn faster? And for medicine, it's similar, right? How do we take advantage of more information about your medical history so we can find a better treatment for you? Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, good. Perhaps about, uh, well, this is your first HLF, of course. That's right. You, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. And it's only been the first day. 
Yes. But when did you arrive? I arrived on Sunday. Uh, so I was concerned of being jet lagged this morning doing my lecture, but then the concerned the, con the but then the the concern shifted to my my sprained foot, uh, which is uh, well, it went well, so I'm I'm happy it's it's done now. But you you had a chance to talk with some of the young researchers. Yes, uh, the, uh, the there was a lot of them after my presentation talking to me and yesterday. Uh, at the reception. The young researchers are very excited about AI, like many uh, around the world. And it's important to have those discussions, both about the scientific content and that they understand that this is a field where you have to think not just about your equations and your code, but also the social responsibility that comes with working in that field. Do you think that the young researchers generally understand and acknowledge that? Some of them. Um, unfortunately, in computer science, there is no formal training about ethics, about social impacts, and I think this is something dearly missing. Um, I wish that even in uh, high school or even primary school, young um, people were exposed to uh, philosophy and understanding how society works so that when they go into science uh, they have uh, the right perspective. What would you like to see happen in five years in your field, ten years in your field? What is the, the ideal uh, success? So the, the kinds of systems we are building today ha still have a fairly superficial understanding of the world around us. And that can be problematic because uh, they can make mistakes like in, in, in medical applications or in autonomous vehicles, which humans wouldn't make and would consider very stupid mistakes. So what I'm working towards, and I don't know if five years is gonna be enough, is building systems that um, are trained on more than just a, a fixed data set but are trained in a way that's more interactive with their environment. So they can build an internal model of their environment, understand some of the structure and causality that allows us, for example, to imagine um, crazy things that haven't happened, that could happen and could be dangerous. So this sort of thing needs to happen to approach human level AI, but also to build safer systems. Okay. I think that's it for me. Thanks again.